Jeff is a PhD student in water resource engineering at SUNY. Um, he focuses on looking into approaches to better monitor riparian vegetation. We heard some uh, in the lightning round. Um, through remote sensing and geospatial means, he got his bachelor's and master's in environmental engineering at Drexel. Uh, where he participated in extensive water resource research projects in both New York City and Venice, Italy. Very nice. All right, please welcome Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I would like to thank Tao for uh, invite me, inviting me to speak here. And, uh, and uh, uh, thank you so much for joining this session. Uh, and I promise I will be speaking a slow and calm voice for this one, so um, here we go. Uh, this, this project has recently finished and we uh, got funding from America View, which is a, a organization from uh, US. Uh, it's a national consortium of uh, different universities and institutions uh, which promote the use of remote sensing for education and research, different purposes. Uh, how many of you in the room know what repairing vegetation is? Just by a show of hands. Great. Uh, so repairing vegetations are uh, located along river corridors, and they provide different uh, benefits to the river by providing canopies, vegetation, biomass, uh, et cetera. And if you remove those repairing vegetations uh, or change them into urban environments, uh, agriculture fields, there's no stopping from the pollution coming from uplands into the river. So essentially you have a polluted river uh, from uplands. So uh, we started our project by thinking about, there's a genuine shift uh, in managing repairing vegetations from going out into the field uh, and take samples, which takes a lot of money and time to using remote sensing uh, that saves a lot of time and uh, also money. And uh, we think uh, by using Google Earth Engine, it can even reduce more of those costs to process those remote sense data. Here's just one opportunity we recognized. Uh, traditionally, if you want to delineate repairing vegetation uh, in the traditional remote sensing or GIS software, it's really uh, complex uh, in the sense of you have to switch back and forth uh, between remote sensing, GIS. You also have to download these images. You have to worry about uh, the image storage. But on the other hand, if you use Google Earth Engine, everything is in one place. Uh, and you don't have to switch back and forth uh, to obtain those repairing vegetation information. The main uh, objective for our project was to see the possibilities of using Google Earth Engine to map over time how these veg repairing vegetation extent and conditions are changing. And uh, we utilized the NAEP imagery as well as the uh, Landsat uh, vegetation index data um, to see the, uh, to map over these different data. Uh, our study site uh, is located uh, in Rochester, New York. Uh, it's a connection point to the uh, Lake Ontario where uh, the river itself is called the Genesee River, uh, as you can see in the black highlighted area. That's the main stem of the, air, uh, the river. And these are some of the characteristics. One of the main driver uh, behind why we select this river is even from satellite imagery, you can see large scale pollution uh, or sedimentation discharge from the Genesee River into Lake Ontario in almost every year. And uh, this large scale uh, it, of pollution event uh, encouraged us and motivated us to work and select this river. So we developed a pro processing scheme all the way from uh, selecting the NAEP imageries to uh, creating the buffer, uh, classifying the image. We also did some post-processing to delineate some of these agriculture fields which had the vegetation at the time. And uh, 
at the end, we got a one meter ground resolution uh, riparian vegetation boundaries. And from those boundaries, we were able to extract information of the vegetation indexes uh, over uh, using the Landsat data. And those data are multi-temporal re repairing vegetation index data. So here on the left, you can see an example of the image classification. We utilized random forest classifier. And uh, uh, on the right, you'll see the quantification of uh, repairing vegetation versus non-repairing vegetation within the, 30, uh, the 90 meter buffer we defined. And you see one clear thing is that the amount of vegetation changes over time. Uh, and uh, there's a general decline of uh, the amount of vegetation within the buffer uh, from that graph. So from the delineate boundaries, we were able to overlay the multi-year data, and we were able to detect where these significant changes uh, from repairing vegetation into different land use, such as residential or agriculture. Uh, and these, I think, will be tremendously helpful for uh, repairing restoration uh, on the ground. For the vegetation index data, uh, at a 30 meter ground resolution, uh, we were able to see the general trend of how the vegetation index change. And you can see on the top left, uh, the vegetation index is strongly influenced by uh, the season, uh, which in the winter it remains dormant and then rise in the spring, peaks in the summer, and then uh, falls down into the fall season. We also did a uh, statistical analysis on the comparing the vegetation index data. And uh, you can see for the different sections of the river above dam and uh, below dam. Um, actually, to back up, I forgot to mention about the dam. So there is a dam uh, right in the middle of the river. Uh, as you can see, there is a black square in the middle. That's uh, where the dam is. And uh, that act as a separation point for us to conduct our analysis, because uh, the flow below the dam uh, is regulated, and the flow above the dam is more of a natural flow. Sorry about jumping around the slides, but the uh, vegetation index, as you see in the top, uh, bottom right, uh, shows the changes of different years, the distribution of vegetation index data. Um, and you can see a, a trend there. Uh, and one important thing I want to mention is we detect some of the uh, land set difference between land, at, land set five and land set eight uh, vegetation index data. Uh, so you see a significant, uh, somewhat a significant increase in the uh, EVI for land set there, uh, comparing to the other land set, uh, land set five data sets. So in conclusion, uh, for our projects, we utilized uh, and developed this method to uh, extract the multi-temporal uh, boundaries and extent for repairing vegetations. And uh, we were also able to extract the mean vegetation index data uh, from the uh, boundaries we delineated. And we think the advantage of utilizing this approach uh, as my advisor says, uh, those signs are very cheesy down there. But uh, I think it's, it's a new approach that uh, can definitely benefit in the future where uh, by utilizing this approach, uh, it will bring much less cost and uh, also increase the processing speed of the repairing uh, the, the remote sensing data for us to understand the meaningful results for repairing vegetations. Uh, if I still have time, uh, we, so we also developed a additional product uh, as for uh, repairing managers and stakeholders, as well as all of you who would like to use vegetation index data. Um, to, uh, this is a 
I call it the NDVI EVI Explorer. So you can basically upload the boundary of where you want to see. Um, and the algorithm will analyze across the whole boundary of land uh, and extract the main vegetation index data across the, that area. Uh, and the data will display over time. Um, yep. Any questions? Did you also do the vegetation classification in Google? I might have just missed this. In Google Earth Engine, and what method do you use? Is it digitization or some type of classifier? You mean within the uh, vegetation? Yeah, so um, like, like exactly like those vegetation change. Um, was that done through some type of classifier or through digitizing around uh, the high resolution aerial uh, images that you were using? Uh, it's, it's, uh, we used the random forest um, classifier. So at this uh, third step, I guess, that's where we conducted the image classification. Um, at my organization, there's a lot of discussion about what constitutes a healthy riparian buffer. So I guess I'm wondering how you guys settled on 90 meters and what thought went into that decision. I was hoping I wasn't. I'm not going to get that question, but. Uh, <laughs> uh, so for those of you who might not know, riparian vegetation, the boundary of it is still like actively being researched on. Uh, the reason why we select 90 meter is uh, we read a paper about uh, setting 90 meter is very efficient uh, to reduce sedimentation. So our goal for this project also is to look at how riparian vegetation can reduce uh, sedimentation in the river. That's why we selected 90 meter. Um, how many classes were you able to use in your classification and approximately what was the accuracy with the NAEP data sets? Yeah, um, so we, we only did a binary, so it was vegetation, non-vegetation. But we are definitely, the next step of the project, we definitely look into uh, classifying the forest or the grass, uh, those. So looking into the details of the vegetation classes. And how accurate was the Oh, yeah. So the, the accuracy, uh, on average, we got actually above 90% uh, accuracy. And uh, I think that's the overall accuracy. Thank you very much for, for your presentation. Can you distinguish between grass and uh, trees based on the you know, spectral reflectance? Can uh, you distinguish between uh, them? For this project, we didn't look into specific classes. That's definitely a step we are looking into. Yes. Yeah. And with uh, NAPR imagery, the, it has a uh, infrared band. So that uh, will give us capability to do that as well. So next, I'd like to introduce um, Chris Dietrich. Come on up. Um, Chris heads a team of technical staff in the operation and management of multiple forest health information systems at USDA Forest Service. Uh, he has an MS in forestry and a BS in wildlife biology and a graduate certificate in geographic information systems. Uh, past lives include working in a greenhouse in exterior and interior landscaping as a plant ecologist, as Madagascar project coordinator and plant recorder for, the, for Missouri Botanical Garden as a database specialist and as a digital information program manager within the US National Park Service. Do you ever work with Brian Fisher? Okay, he's an ant guy in Madagascar. He's, I like ants. <laughs> All right, please join me in welcoming Chris. Right. So uh, the group I work for in the Forest Service is the Forest Health uh, Assessment and Applied Sciences team. Um, we, all the work we do is directly in line with the mission of the Forest Service. Um, and we are trying to deliver you know, technologies and services to the field. Um, our scope is all lands, and what that means is the work we do and the people we work with is not just forest service ownership. Um, many of the folks who collect data for us and use our data um, are with state agencies and also with uh, private organizations. Uh, the Forest Disturbance Mapping Program, FDMAP, um, is uh, looking at uh, assessing change in forest 
uh, due to uh, insects and pathogens. Uh, this includes defoliators and other kinds of disturbance agents. Um, let's see. Um, so we're producing thematic maps with the FDMAP program. Uh, we're using Landsat and Sentinel-2 and MODIS data. Um, and this is used to augment um, our IDS or insect and disease survey data. Now, there's, I probably should have stuck a slide in here and I didn't, so pretend there's another slide up there and it shows an airplane flying over the forest, okay? That's our aerial data survey program and that program has go been going on for, I believe, oh, nearly 100 or over 100 years. People flying in planes, looking at the forest on some kind of a map. It used to be analog, now it's digital. We deploy a system on tablets where people um, create features and attribute those features with hosts and pest information. Um, and it's, it's been a good system, and it still is a good system. However, there are some problems with it. It's expensive to put people up in airplanes. It's dangerous to put people up in airplanes. Um, and there are some errors that come along with that. And the FD map program is looking at trying to get around some of those limitations of aerial data survey. Um, a big part of it is a safety component, reducing the number of flights that we do, reducing flights in hazardous areas where there's very mountainous terrain. Those flights typically fly between 1,000 and 2,000 feet, I believe. So, you know, it's fairly close to the ground, and there's some problems around that. So that's what FDMAP is uh, working on. And I'll, it's sort of an alternative approach. There we go. Um, so Landsat data, it's got a good resolution for the kind of work we're doing. Um, it's good for local scale analyses. Uh, we've started using Sentinel data, um, and that provides a better temporal resolution for the work we're doing. Um, and we're starting to combine those two together. Um, and we've just been doing that more recently. Um, and we have some ideas for how we might do that a little better in the future. Um, our production is based on, you know, what did we survey last year? Uh, what is needed for the National Insect and Disease Risk Map? Um, we also get real, uh, it's dependent on, you know, what's going on with the real-time forest disturbance data. That data is something that we work on in a partnership with the Geospatial uh, Technology Application Center, which is sort of a counterpart group within the Forest Service there over in Salt Lake uh, City. Uh, also. You know, the, the areas that we fly and the work that we do is based on what ground survey and observations there are and what requests we get from the field. So, this slide. If you look to the two images on the left, you can kind of imagine those as the bad old days before GEE. And the one on the right is the bright, shining future in which we all now live that GEE is available to us. So uh, before 2009, as you probably know, Landsat data was expensive to acquire. And um, so it really kind of limited the kinds of things that could be done with respect to what we're doing now. So a lot of you know, just two data analysis, a, sort of a before and after this point, that point kind of analysis. Once that imagery was made available for free, uh, it freed things up a little bit, <clears throat> able to do multi-year analyses. Um, but still, data management is an, an issue. You know, it's, it's complicated and uh, it's uh, sort of burdensome and time consuming. But now that we've got GEE, now we're on the <clears throat> bright shining future part, um, we can do these really dense multi-year and multi-points within year analyses on the data because it makes it possible to actually crunch these large data sets. So as you, everyone's been saying, bring this great stack of data together, bring the computational power together, and voila, now you've got a way that you can actually uh, look at some of the questions that you've been wanting to look at for years, but just really haven't had the capacity to do. So it's really been a boon to us. And as I said earlier, being able to use GEE to replace aerial data survey, it kind of actually saves lives. I mean, we've had people die in airplanes because they're flying over the forest looking for trees with bugs, so, you know. Um, so, two types of analyses that we're doing. First one is a Z-score. It's optimized for sort of uh, quick onset events like defoliators. A lot of times with defoliators, they come in, they eat all the leaves off the trees, and then the trees refoliate. Um, and the way this works is, you know, so you're assessing each pixel for change. Um, and what we're doing is we're comparing the change in that pixel against the reference data set of the previous three years. Um, and so, again, quick onset. Uh, we got these three years that we're looking at comparing the current year to. And from that, 
uh, reference population, you can get a z-score, and that's how you determine whether that change is significant. Um, our other method is trend disturbance data. And um, again, looking at pixel by pixel, we're looking at the data, we're uh, comparing it to previous years. So this is sort of a five year rather than uh, this year and the past three years kind of look at things. And what we're looking at is the slope of that line and whether or not that meets a threshold or not tells you whether or not that disturbance is sort of a normal change or whether, sorry, whether that change is normal or whether it's outside the range of normal. Um, here we go. Uh, again, longer term onset events. These are things like drought related stress and mortality, also bark beetles uh, rather than defoliators. So they're getting at the tree's physiology in a different way and it's taking longer for that to have an effect on the, on the forest and on the trees. Um, again, keep in mind it's the slope of that line that, that you're looking at rather than um, the standard deviation and mean comparison. So a couple of examples, sort of case studies. Uh, this is the Kaibab National Forest, which is north of the Grand Canyon. Um, Pandora moth, a defoliator on pine trees. And being a, a biologist in a past life, I just have to point out, I mean, if you look at that caterpillar eating that leaf, and then you look at the branch it's sitting on, I think this is a remarkable uh, example of mimicry that's really good. They, they dialed that in over the that past few million years, so. Um, Anyway, so here we go. Sorry, I had to do that. Um, here's an example of uh, these forests. This is a defoliated uh, coniferous stand. Um, we analyzed this data with both MODIS and Landsat, so different uh, resolutions. And what you're seeing in the, in the square, the cockeyed square, is the area that was flown for aerial data survey. And the polygons you see delineated, that's what the aerial surveyor delineated, okay? So pretty good agreement between the remote sensed imagery and the um, aerial da damage survey. So what you see in green hasn't changed. What you see in yellow changed the previous year, and what you see in red has changed for this year. Now, one thing to note, if I don't know how well you can see in my arrow, but you see this big white patch up here. This is a burn scar, so there's no vegetation here. Now you also note that here's a polygon that overlaps that burn scar, so that's an error of uh, commission made by the aerial data surveyor, damage surveyor. Sorry, I didn't mean to click up the next uh, animation, but then you'll also notice right in this area, in this area and down here in the bottom, there are some areas of omission where the, for whatever reason, the damage uh, aerial surveyor didn't, didn't catch that. Now, anecdotally, I heard that on this flight when the, when the aerial surveyor looked at this data with our team, she said, oh yeah, that was a really, um, bad air day. It was a lot of turbulence. She was actually getting sick for part of the time. So again, this is, this is the kind of thing that happens with aerial damage survey. It's a, it's a great tool, but there are things that just happen that you can't, you know, I, I haven't heard of anyone getting motion sick using remote sensing. <laughs> so, you know, it's just two different tools. They do different things. Uh, the inset that popped up at the end there with the two ADS years, um, that just shows what was flown in each of the years. And you can see that this area, I'm going to show it on the MODIS side, this area of yellow corresponds to this area that was flown that previous year. Right? So it just kind of gives you an idea of, of how the aerial uh, damage survey works. Uh, let's see. Okay, so now here's an example of how we're using that trend disturbance data. Um, on the right, you see photos of the landscape that was surveyed. This is Southern California. Um, let's see here. Okay, so on, on the left, you see the remote sensed data. Again, same thing. Green is no change. Yellow has changed the year before. I know it's a little hard to see the yellow at the scale. Uh, and red is the currently disturbed. On the right, you'll see this is the area that was that's shown, and the area that was flown uh, was bigger than that. But what you'll notice is that um, for aerial damage survey, they caught a lot of this, but they missed a fair amount over here and I can't tell, maybe down there. It's hard, it, it, but the take home point here is that aerial uh, damage survey, again, it's a good tool, it's not a perfect tool, no tool is perfect, but we're seeing some cases where uh, remote sensing can really you know, get at uh, things in a, in a more uh, 
uh, it'd get better coverage on, on what we're looking at. And then this is another example of uh, gypsy moth. It's a defoliator in the Northeast US. Um, and the, the t again, you know, red being this year, yellow being previous years, uh, pretty extensive survey that happened here. Um, and the point here is that yes, while this defoliator is one of these um, quick onset type events, these defoliators come back to the same area year after year. And so what can happen is, you know, trees that get stressed from you know, having to refoliate every year for successive years eventually does cause mortality and a longer term trend. So, um, and that's just photos of, um, it's a, I know a little hard to see, but that, uh, the, the one in the far right corner, that's a refoliated uh, tree. Okay, so where are we going with this? Um, work more with uh, Sentinel-2 data, try and get some atmospheric correction going on. Uh, combine, we've, we've been combining Landsat with Sentinel-2 to improve temporal resolution. Also looking at improving the algorithms. So get growing degree days into the Z-score and TDD analyses. Growing degree days is a way of getting at phenology of both the hosts and the pests. So it helps dial in the windows at which you're doing your comparisons. Um, also building spectral libraries of hosts and pests, so trying to get signatures for these things. And then, you know, I was in the uh, cloud platform uh, session earlier this week, and it got me thinking about whether or not we could get some machine learning going on these models to see if we can improve them even further, because, you know, if we can train the, uh, the, the model a little better, I think we'd get even better results. And for more information and more data, go to our our uh, Forest Health Portal. And I just want to introduce the guys who aren't here who are the FDMAP team, and that's Matt Vernier and Vern Thomas. So if you have any questions, those are the guys to contact. You'll have their information here. And I also want to point out that we have someone in the audience who can get at some of the statistical questions if you have them in a much better way than I can, and that's John Withrow. John, stick up your hand. There you go. All right, great. And so that's what I've got. Any questions? Yeah, I'm wondering if um, you're seeing any trends of uh, additional stress and mortality due to um, climatic changes, um, also due to latitudinal shifts of, 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 um, of insect vectors and maybe some elevational. I've heard some horror stories about um, bark beetles crossing elevational areas and, and getting to new zones. Are you guys right. seeing any behavior like that? Well, two things I'll say about that. One, I've only been with the program for a little over a year, so I don't have all the history. And two, I mean, we tend to be looking at shorter term. I mean, you know, the, sort of the, the max term that we're kind of looking at right now is the past few years. John may know more about, you know, what the longer term trends have been. And, but I, yes, I would expect that we would be seeing those. And uh, I haven't heard some of the anecdotes you have, but again, I haven't been with the program that long, so. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I was just wondering, if, and maybe I missed it. Um, can you relate those detections to, so they're not complete canopy loss, basically. There's some proportion canopy loss. Can you relate it to proportion canopy loss? Oh. Hmm. It's no. the one question. There's, there's two parts. Okay, go, go. Wait, this, it's two questions, actually. It's not actually related. <laughs> no, I'm to the sorry, you only get one. Okay. No. <laughs> are you sure, the second part is, are you sure those, those, those detections that were picked up with the model weren't errors of commission? Or they've been checked for, for, like there was damage that was detected with the model that the aerial sketch mapper didn't detect because they were um, throwing up. Throwing up, yeah. basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, they did, I believe that was error checked. So, First question was again. Can, uh, to to oh, so how much of the change was canopy loss? What percentage canopy loss? Oh, um, I don't know the ranges on that. I don't know. Sorry, I can't really answer that. I mean, there is some percentage, you know, and defoliators, you know, they're some are host specific and some are not. So it depends on the kind of forest you're in. But yeah, I haven't. I don't know the, the answer to that. I'm just poking around on your website now as you've put the URL up there, but I'm just curious, you know, you sort of mentioned the idea that maybe going into um, machine learning and things like that. Is the data available? I mean, I have lots of students that would love to, you know, see where the yeah, machine the learning worked. Yeah, the data's available. So, yeah. you know, we can go in and you know, use the training data and what have you that it's 
It's in here somewhere? As far as I know, it is. Or if, if not, get in touch with one of us and we'll get you what we can because it is public domain data. It's available to anybody who wants it. We have it available, I believe, for download or I think we also have web services running so you can just pull it straight in through uh, as re data services. So we have an AGOL page that you can get data from. So. Excellent. ArcGIS Online, sorry, AGOL. So right now, are you using remote sensing to determine the vector at all or is that just... You're going back later and seeing what the disturbance was. Well, they have they already have a, a pretty good idea what the what the vectors are at the time that they go and fly, and and so uh, part of it is you know right now just seeing what we can do. That's can can we replace aerial data survey, right? That's sort of the first question, and it looks like we probably can. A little better training, that kind of thing. Then I believe the bullet that was about getting the host and. Uh, Vector libraries uh, and pest libraries, those are, for, I, I believe, getting at signatures so that you don't have to know what you're looking for before you go to look for it. But that wasn't something you were getting from the aerial survey anyway, is the vector No, side. no, because, because keep in mind that these are mostly local efforts, and people know what's in their forest. They know what the vectors, you know, what, what's going on, what the hosts are and what the pests are for the most part. Now, in some cases, they may see some damage, and that's what the ground survey is about. It's about going out and saying, well, I think I saw something there, and I think that's what it is, but if you're out in the truck, go have a look and, and see if that matches up. And you know, that, that helps train. Uh, yeah, the aerial surveyors are able to determine, in most cases, what it is, because they've been trained mm -hmm. to recognize the disturbance from Douglas fir beetle versus Douglas fir tussock moth. You know, so there's, there's different types of signatures that they see there from the air. So uh, we're trying to replicate those, that same human eye mm -hmm. uh, comparative strategy at, a, at a, a satellite level. And part of what it is is that we're, we've been able to implement some phenology into it. We know when the eggs are supposed to hatch for gypsy moths. So if we see a part of the country that's showing some defoliator activity, but it hasn't passed the number of growing degree days yet for that egg hatch to happen, we know it's not gypsy moth, that kind of thing. Uh, so what happens with the data once you've c created it? Like what, who, who consumes it and what do they do with it? Um, we make it available through that portal, is my understanding. And um, you know, anybody, again, anybody who's interested in it can come get, get it from us. Um, you know. the, uh, there's other agencies, the state agencies use it a lot, I think. Well, I know they use the aerial data, damage survey data because they collected it. So they share it with us in a way that we want it and then they use it for whatever nefarious purposes they have at the state level. <laughs> Usually, it's a re usually requests from the governors to, to find out what's going on with forest resources and things like that. So it's, it's an interesting program because, like I said, probably half or more of the people who are collecting that ADS data don't even work for the Forest Service and aren't necessarily uh, focused on Forest Service lands. So um, we, we have a kind of a unique mandate. Um, so other, other agencies and anybody in the public can use the data and, and does. So it's just a, a follow-on question from from Tao. Actually, is it is it are the data used to kind of target responses to that? Like, do they then cut down the trees that have been damaged, or no? It's um, it's more about understanding what damage is happening now. In some cases, they do do treatments, and there's another ha sort of half of our organization that does get into the technologies of treatments. I'm not very familiar with that. So at this point, it's still pretty early on, but the, the idea is sort of for this one group in our organization, um, the remote sensing group, to kind of put the aerial data survey group out of work. In, in, in a sense, that's what Bye. we're trying to do, so. Uh, Chris uh, Doughty and Eleanor uh, Thompson. Uh, Chris Doughty is a, an assistant professor at Northern Arizona University, and Eleanor Thompson has been working with Chris for the last year funded by a Google Earth Engine grant. Um, she has a background in environmental sciences and is starting a PhD um, in the fall at Oxford University to continue working on this project. Please join me in welcoming Chris and Eleanor. So uh, first of all, I'd like to say this is a collaboration of a huge number of people. Um, but uh, especially in collaboration with the uh, University of Oxford. Um, so today, Eleanor, sitting over there, she'll be up in a few minutes, uh, are gonna, we're gonna be talking about uh, trying to use the Earth Engine to measure tropical forest productivity. So first of all, what is productivity? It can mean actually a couple of things. So uh, what we're defining it as in this talk is total growth, so root growth, 
wood growth, uh, leaf growth. Uh, but the same method that we're, we're talking about uh, can actually be used to predict uh, uh, woody productivity, uh, total uh, photosynthesis. And uh, we're not going to talk about it, but we're hoping at some point to be able to uh, uh, predict tree mortality as, as well. Um, but first of all, why, why are we interested in uh, carbon, understanding carbon cycling in, in tropical forests? Obviously, deforestation we've heard a lot about, and, uh, uh, and that's, you know, it's, I think it's obvious to everyone why we want to understand more about that. We also want to understand something about growth in these, these forests. And the chief reason is every time we, were, we burn fossil fuel, um, a little bit of that is going into forests. And we think uh, a good portion of that uh, carbon is actually going to tropical forests, making them a little bit bigger over time. But like any living organism, they can't infinitely get bigger and bigger. And at some point, they're going to stop getting bigger because they're going to be faced with nutrient constraints, water constraints. Uh, and they're going to stop subsidizing or, or putting CO2 in the atmosphere. And to understand global climate, it's really key for us to understand uh, growth in the tropics, how long, we can, how long they're going to keep taking up this carbon, when they're going to potentially uh, turn around. Um, so a lot of you, are, uh, everyone here probably knows that there is a product for measuring uh, 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 NPP uh, in the tropics, MODIS NPP product. And a huge number of people use it. It's uh, kind of key integral for a lot of uh, uh, the baseline data for a lot of uh, climate simulations. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't work terribly well in the tropics. And the reason is uh, the signal saturates. So basically, it's kind of a uses, MODIS uses a band method. So basically, you're kind of comparing visible reflectance to the near infrared reflectance. And in the near infrared, you get a little bit of information on how many leaves there are, uh, which can kind of you know, tell you a little bit something about growth rates through a model. Um, but the problem in the tropics is that it, that tends to saturate at about leaf area index of four. So one, two, three, four leaves. But tropical forests have many more leaves than that. So you can't really tell the difference between a forest that has you know, a leaf area index of six versus a leaf area index of eight versus four. Um, so hence, this is kind of one of the reasons why we're working. Um, uh, we want to develop a better method of, um, of uh, productivity. Um, so, you know, the first part is ground validation. It's actually really difficult to, to ground validate uh, growth uh, in, in the tropics. Um, I mean, it's, it's different than deforestation. It's a little bit deforestation. You can kind of go out there, someone visits it, and you can verify your, uh, your, 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 uh, your estimate. But um, basically, uh, in collaboration with many, many people, um, um, we've developed a, a network of sites. About, we're at, I think we have about 50 throughout the tropics. So South America, Brazil, Peru, Bolivia, um, Africa, Ghana, Gabon, uh, and Malaysia in Southeast Asia, where we have a, a standardized method for measuring uh, root growth, wood growth, leaf growth, um, all the respiratory processes. Uh, and if you add the, the autotrophic respiration plus growth, you can get an estimate of total photosynthesis. So we basically have all components of the, the carbon cycle at, uh, at these plots. Um, and at a subset of these plots, we were, we're also measuring uh, traits. So what I mean by traits is basically leaf uh, uh, photosynthesis, leaf chemistry, leaf thickness, and we're measuring spectroscopy. So um, basically, this is put a spectrometer on a leaf measuring detailed spectral signature from 400 to 2,500 nanometers. Um, and we have this at, uh, I think, around 15 of, of, the, of the plots uh, globally right now. Um, and there's actually a lot of theory that says if you understand something about traits in a forest, you can actually predict growth rates of, of that forest in a much better way than, um, uh, than what we're currently doing with, uh, with MODIS. Um, and uh, there's actually been a huge amount of work showing that uh, with detailed leaf spectroscopy, uh, you can predict leaf traits. So this has been shown extensively at the leaf level. And, and now in more and more studies have been shown at, uh, uh, at the airborne scale. And the idea behind this method is the same approach that we hope to, uh, Eleanor is going to show some of the work she's been, been doing, trying to apply this to the Earth engine. So currently, a lot of remote sensing is kind of this band methodology where you, you just look at the difference. Like NDVI is a classic where you look at the difference between the visible and the near infrared. Um, but the this, uh, this statistical method that we've, we've been using is a lot better because you can basically use the integrated signal. You, statistically, you basically take all the spectral data you have and you come up with the best statistical model you can for predicting things like leaf traits. So obviously, it's a lot easier if you have 2,500 nanometers of, of, of data. Um, but we'll show that you can actually, when you kind of downscale it uh, to the aircraft level, uh, with which mu much less uh, spectral data, you can um, still make good predictions of, of these, these leaf traits. 
Um, and so the question we're asking is, well, can we apply this same sort of methodology globally? Uh, we're going to talk about productivity first, but uh, later on um, to, to other things, um, including photosynthesis uh, and even a potential uh, uh, signal for tree mortality. Uh, and so basically we have, uh, these are the plots where we're, we're, we're basically calibrating this, this model from. So we have basically ground-based uh, data for growth over several years, productivity. Um, we have the, the trait data, and we have uh, the, the spectral data uh, from, from all of these plots. And now Eleanor is going to take over. Hi, um, I'm Eleanor. Uh, so as Chris um, explained, our kind of new approach to measuring tropical forest productivity is taking reflectance uh, spectra, uh, linking that to leaf traits, uh, such as leaf thickness, um, leaf nutrient concentrations like nitrogen or phosphorus or calcium, and then linking those leaf traits uh, to um, processes uh, like photosynthesis and respiration. Uh, to overall um, get net primary productivity, which is just overall photosynthesis in the ecosystem minus respiration. Um, so this method has been quite well established at the individual leaf level. Uh, and the question is, can you scale this up to the canopy level? So if you take um, a reflectance spectra over a tropical forest canopy, uh, where you have all the problems of you know, non-leaf matter, um, leaves at different angles, um, different size leaves, etc. Um, so if you incorporate these interference effects, uh, can you still predict leaf traits uh, and ultimately um, NPP um, with any significance? Um, so this technique uh, has recently um, become quite well known, um, basically due to almost one man, uh, Greg Asner, who uh, some of you uh, may be familiar with. Um, so he works at Stanford. Um, he has his own plane, uh, the Carnegie Airborne Obser Observatory, uh, which he flies over tropical forests uh, and maps these leaf traits. Um, unfortunately, we don't have our own plane, uh, sadly. Uh, so we've been trying to um, develop the same technique uh, using drones. Um, so we've attached a hyperspectral camera uh, that measures from about 400 to 950 nanometers um, onto our drones um, and then flown them over a couple of our um, tropical forest plots in Ghana. Um, so we have eight tropical forest plots uh, stretching across a precipitation gradient uh, from high precipitation in the south uh, in Ankasa to low precipitation in the north uh, or lower precipitation uh, in Kojai. Uh, and then using um, the canopy hyperspectral data, um, we've uh, combined this uh, with our ground truth leaf trait data, uh, so leaf thickness, uh, leaf nutrient concentrations, um, to see if we can predict uh, leaf traits at the individual crown level. Um, and uh, the relationships are looking quite nice. Um, some significant R squared values, a uh, good percentage root mean square error. Um, and then using the hyperspectral canopy data, we can create maps of uh, these leaf traits. Um, over our tropical forest plots. Um, so here are three. Um, and then if you combine these leaf trait values for each pixel, you can actually say, say something quite interesting um, about the life strategy of um, different trees in these plots uh, using the leaf economic spectrum. So some of you might be familiar uh, with this theory. Um, so this is a theory. Um, that basically says in kind of high fertility, high precipitation environments, um, uh, trees just want to grow quickly. They want to reach a gap in the canopy as quickly as possible uh, and get there before any of their neighbors get there. Uh, so they kind of grow these thin, uh, cheap leaves um, with high nutrient concentrations that can photosynthesize quickly uh, and they can reach that gap in the canopy um, before anyone else. Um, so it's like a live fast, um, uh, die young kind of strategy. Uh, whereas in slightly lower precipitation or nutrient regimes, um, trees grow slightly thicker leaves with slightly lower nutrient concentrations um, because they want these leaves to persist. They want to defend themselves against uh, herbivory or disease because if they lose these leaves, they don't have the resources to quickly replace them. Um, 
so combining uh, leaf thickness, uh, nitrogen and phosphorus, uh, you can see that in uh, both Ancasa plots, uh, the trees tend to fall um, on the kind of uh, live long but persist end of the spectrum uh, with high uh, leaf thickness but low nutrient uh, concentrations. Uh, whereas in Bobbery, the trees tend to fall on the kind of live fast, die young end of the spectrum. Um, with uh, lower uh, leaf thickness but higher nutrient concentrations. Um, and the question is, where does the Earth engine fit into all of this? Uh, well, the really great thing about the Earth engine is that we can scale up these uh, drone level um, results. Because, um, of course, it would take a very long time to map tropical forests with a drone. Um, so we've created um, some maps of these leaf traits uh, in the Earth engine. Um, so uh, this is just showing leaf thickness across Ghana. Um, and around each of our tropical forest plots uh, in the Earth Engine, we've just drawn a polygon um, and taken the average trait value. Uh, so this is using Landsat data um, that the Landsat data predicts uh, for that leaf trait and then regressed it um, against our ground truth values. Um, and you can see that we've got some quite nice relationships uh, for these leaf traits. Uh, so leaf thickness, uh, nitrogen, uh, calcium, and then the two ASAT and AMAX are just different uh, photosynthesis um, rates. Uh, but the question is, um, that works in Ghana uh, because we kind of calibrated this model on the canopy da data taken from our plots in Ghana. Uh, so you'd expect it to work quite well um, in similar areas where you have similar forest types. Uh, but does this have any predictive power across continents? Um, so we've jumped here to South America, to Peru. Uh, and here you have um, a figure taken from one of Greg Asner's papers. Uh, so he used his plane to map um, uh, leaf thickness um, across uh, the whole of Peru. Uh, it took him quite a long time. I think it took him about three years uh, using his plane. Um, so the question is, can you do this a lot quicker uh, using the Earth engine? Uh, so here's our map um, that we create in the Earth Engine. And you can see there are definite similarities um, between, the two, uh, between the two figures. Um, and then looking at the absolute values, once again, um, we regress the predicted Landsat values um, with 10 forest plots um, that we have in Peru across an Amazon to Andes transect. Um, and you can see there again, quite a nice relationship. Um, and the same for uh, nitrogen. Um, and so kind of scaling this up uh, to the whole of tropical forest areas, this is getting a bit ahead of ourselves um, at the moment. So here are some preliminary maps um, that, uh, that we created. Um, so this is for leaf thickness. And you can see that in, um, in the kind of high fertility, uh, high precipitation areas, you have um, low leaf thickness, which is what we'd uh, expect, um, and then increasing um, outside of these areas as precipitation declines. Um, so this is in the Congo Basin and West Africa, um, and the same in South America. Um, so you can see uh, leaf thickness declining up the Andes to Amazon elevation gradient and also into the Cerrado. Um, and this is uh, nitrogen concentration. Uh, so you can see obviously nitrogen concentration is highest um, in the middle of the Congo Basin, declining outwards, um, and following quite a similar uh, pattern to, um, to leaf thickness. Um, so these are some preliminary maps we've created. Um, and uh, as, uh, as Tal said, said um, I'm starting a PhD in September, uh, where I hope to kind of continue working on this project um, and hopefully developing some maps of these leaf traits uh, and ultimately tropical forest productivity uh, which can then be imported into the Earth Engine. So. All right, it's Any great. questions? Yeah, I have time for a few questions. Um, <laughs> my first question was, uh, and it's fantastic, first of all. Um, my, my first question was for the Peru map. How is that, how is that validated? Um, sorry, the one that I created. Yeah. Um, so this one is just, um, we're kind of just using this as a visual comparison okay. uh, to, uh, to Asna's map at the moment. Okay. Um, but then this graph here, um, that's validated using the predicted Landsat values uh, for, um, for 10 tropical forest plots 
uh, stretching from the Amazon uh, up the Andes. And then we have the ground truth um, actual trait uh, data for those plots that it's been regressed against. OK. If that makes um, sense. My second question was, how long did it take you to do that map for Peru? Um, so this one crater in the Earth engine. Yeah. Um, it didn't take, it took about a week. I mean, the whole, the whole process of creating the leaf, tra uh, leaf trait map, um, et cetera, et cetera, took about a week of kind of uh, working out how to, how to do that in the Earth engine. And I mean, just creating this map here took about five minutes just to clip out an image of it. OK. And then my, my third question was, um, in terms of kind of the, the tree mortality, that Chris, you had mentioned. Do you see any utility for this in something like um, forest degradation mapping? Definitely. So we, we didn't talk about this other data set that we have. Uh, so basically, we've been monitoring a time series of uh, trait and spectral data uh, throughout this last El Nino. Um, so we've basically been, well, hopefully, I mean, this is part of Eleanor's future work to be able to use this uh, PLSR method to uh, predict future mortality. Um, degradation, I, I mean, I think, I think as well, I mean, uh, I guess it depends. I mean, we, we're always looking for new data sets. But I mean, the data sets we have tend to be not in degraded forests. They tend to be in more uh, um, uh, primary forests, I guess you could say. Uh, but it'd be nice to work with other data sets as well for, for that. So are the letters um, the sites of the drone spectrometry on the map on the left, the A, C, E, B, et cetera? Oh, yeah. OK. So using sure. those training sites, you upscale to the Landsat. Do you take uh, an average of the spectral range in the spectrometry to match the Landsat, or do you compare them directly? Um, so, uh, so we created this map um, actually using our data from Ghana. Um, so in the future, rather than just uh, taking data from, uh, from Ghana and upscaling to the whole world, we hope to calibrate it on a lot more different forest types and forest plots. Uh, these numbers are just, um, uh, all these letters are just the letters that ASNA used um, to kind of talk about the different areas of Peru. And, uh, and we've used them so you can kind of uh, see the areas of interest and see how well they compare to our map. Um, yeah, I guess okay. we should we should clarify. We're fairly <laughs> confident on the Ghana stuff. Uh, for the rest yeah. of it, find some pretty maps to scale up to show what we're hoping to do in three four years. <laughs> right. And um, one other question: um, So these leaf traits could they be mapped to species for biodiversity research? Yeah. So at the at the plot level, we definitely have all the species names. So basically, the the goal for uh, for each of these these one hectare plots, we try to capture 80% of basal area of the plot. So we're not capturing all the species. We're just capturing kind of the dominant species. But we do know the species names. Uh, and we've, we've collected a huge amount of traits. And it's not, we're still kind of in the process of publishing just the actual data sets. But it'll all be available relatively soon. You've, you've done most of this work in, in tropical forests. So any thought to doing similar analysis, or would this work for temperate forests, or any consideration um, for that? It yeah, should. It, yeah. would, it would work for temperate forests. So this technique was actually first developed um, for temperate forests. Um, this, so Greg Asner has really pushed it forward in tropical forests. Uh, so temperate forests have actually kind of been a bit left behind. Uh, but there's no reason why it shouldn't work in temperate forests as well. I mean, I always view it, you know, it's the band method versus using all the spectral data. And I feel like using all the spectral data would be an improvement over, you know, just comparing two bands. So I think you know it could it could work well everywhere. It's just kind of validating with the data. That, that, that's yeah. Can you would there can you think of anything that you might that might have to be done slightly differently to work for temperate forests? Well, I think you'd need to you need to train the the model using temperate data, which we we don't have. At least, I mean, other people may have, but we it's not really our our focus right now. Hi. I guess you've already slightly answered this question about the species. So presumably, then you can start talking about invasive species and plantation forests and that sort of thing? Um, yeah. yeah, so um, so invasive species um, actually have a very unique combination of traits. Um, so again, Asna has done some really interesting work in Hawaii where he's used this, um, this method to map leaf traits across um, forests in Hawaii. And using the kind of combination of leaf traits, um, he can kind of point out the areas where invasive species uh, are dominating. Because uh, they often have quite high nutrient uh, leaf uh, concentration levels. Um, so using these, um, using these maps, you could definitely say something interesting about invasive species. Yeah, and then the next obvious interesting step would be you know, with 
with really high resolution satellite data, because he's basically flying over again with this plane that's quite, quite expensive. Um, can you still get the same sort of resolution? I mean, you're not going to get the same resolution, but can you still pick out the invasive species? And we'll see. So our last group is from the World Resources Institute. Um, there are three folks coming up. Um, uh, Asa Strong is a research analyst. Um, he, he, program, he programs uh, GIS for the Global Forest Watch project. Uh, Charlie Hoffman is a software engineer on GFW. And Brookie uh, Gusner Williams is the chief data scientist there. And they'll tell us about Global Forest Watch and some new algorithms in there. Oh, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Um, so Global Forest Watch launched in early 2014, and Google Earth Engine has been absolutely essential for powering the analysis and visualization on our website. Um, so Global Forest Watch seeks to collect some of the most up-to-date and decision-relevant information on forests worldwide. One of the first products we launched with was the Global Forest Change dataset created by Matt Hansen and his colleagues at the University of Maryland which provided a Landsat resolution look at tree cover loss on a yearly basis from 2001 to 2012. And we've since updated the data with 2013, 14, and 15. Um, and on the Global Forest Watch website, you can, uh, we surface really user-friendly um, ways to interact with the data, such as being able to press play and see a timeline, a uh, time lapse of this data um, on an annual basis, uh, which is what we're seeing here in this GIF. Um, you can also circle an area of interest using a draw polygon tool and get analysis results back uh, for your area of interest, such as the total tree cover loss in that area, the total tree cover gain, and the total tree cover extent. Um, you can also uh, do the same type of analysis with contextual data sets that we collect. So for example, the World Database on Protected Areas is also in Global Forest Watch, and you can analyze the same data within protected areas or uh, contextual data sets like logging concessions and mining concessions. Um, additionally, you can also subscribe to an area of interest. So if you're very interested in a particular national park, you could uh, subscribe with an email, and we will send you an alert anytime there's a forest change going on within that area. Uh, Matt Hansen's data set was the first time that we had a globally consistent and locally relevant data set, which allowed us on forest change worldwide, which allowed us to create insights such as this statistic here, that every minute uh, the forest size of 20 football fields is cut down. So this is the problem that we're trying to address at Global Forest Watch. Uh, we then uh, tried to provide near real-time data sets to our users. Um, so what we're looking at here is uh, the University of Maryland's GLAD alerts, which are also at a Landsat resolution, but are updated weekly. Um, so here we're looking at uh, palm oil development within an intact forest landscape, or relatively contiguous um, forest until um, the palm oil was developed here. Um, and here we can actually update this data on a weekly basis and provide users with the same kind of friendly analysis tools um, to dive deeper into this data. Um, here we see the GLAD alerts uh, like uh, forming logging roads uh, in Peru. And this is actually in a buffer area of a national park. Um, so we try to disseminate this information to our users through maps, through subscriptions, um, through our open data portal, uh, and, and we try to have make it as friendly as possible so that we can make an impact on the ground. And Charlie's going to talk about um, some of the impact that, that we've seen. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I think that's a lot of my work uh, with GFW is, you know, we've, we've got this great data in Earth Engine. You know, most of it comes from the Hansen Lab. And, you know, what can we do to bring that data to our users? You know, we've got a great website. Uh, we can make some nice GIFs. You know, we can see these logging roads. But, you know, how do we impact decision makers and, you know, those actually protecting the forest? Uh, so our first example here is, is from Peru. Um, we were actually able to integrate our data, you know, the, these layers, you know, this analysis um, into the Ministry of Environment's uh, many geo portals um, in Peru. So, you know, now when one of those, their analysts comes into work, you know, they load their web page and, you know, in context with all the layers that are important, you know, their protected areas, um, their buffer zones, their national parks, um, they can see, you know, this data that we're updating, you know, at a really rapid rate. Um, and, you know, they can use that uh, to, you know, task their patrols, um, send people out to investigate these areas um, and ulti ultimately prosecute uh, this illegal logging. 
our other, um, this is kind of quick, but our other big, you know, one of our other uh, success stories and areas of emphasis is, okay, so, you know, we can, we can reach, you know, a lot of web users, you know, we can, you know, we can integrate a lot of this stuff in your basic, you know, web application. What about uh, users, you know, in low bandwidth or offline environments? Um, this example is the National Forest Authority uh, in Uganda. Um, they're tasked with preventing or protecting 4.9 million hectares of forest landscape with a staff of around 300. Um, we partnered with the Jane Goodall Institute uh, to develop an Android application called Forest Watcher that basically allows uh, these rangers to load Glad Alerts data um, onto, you know, into this app for an area of interest uh, and then go out into the field in these offline environments and navigate to these areas. Um, within a month of, you know, the release of the beta version, uh, some of these rangers had discovered a logging camp, you know, in the middle of an intact forest landscape. It was just one pixel, you know, it was 30 meters by 30 meters, um, but it was something that, you know, they never would have noticed, they never would have come across on any of their regular patrols. Um, and, and they went out there and they, you know, they navigated using the app and they were able to um, shut down the operation uh, and, and find the culprits. And so, yeah, I, I think, you know, all this, I'm not a remote sensing person, I'm kind of a programming person who's tasked with getting this information into the hands of the decision makers, so I think that's, you know, also, you know, really helpful, um, you know, usage of Earth Engine, kind of building APIs on top of that data and making it available. Um, at GFW, at WRI, we do do some of our own uh, remote sensing work, and I'll turn it over to Brookie now to talk about that. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about a product we're just about to release uh, next week, I hope. Um, it's Forma 250. For those of you who've been around a while, you might remember we used to have a product up on the website called Forma. Um, and so I'm going to go through this really fast because of time. Um, but please, if you have any questions, um, come ask me later. So this is a screenshot from our staging site. Um, there's two types of data that are going to be made available. One is we're calling Forma. Uh, but I'll, I'll refer to it as former 250 throughout this talk. Uh, um, and then also we're, we have what we're calling Forma Active Clearing Alerts, and I'll explain what those are. And this, uh, as mentioned, is an iteration on an older product, one of the first products on Global Forest Watch, which was also called Forma. Um, it was a 500 meter product uh, that used NDVI firms and some precipitation data. It combined it um, and it trained on a product, everyone's used to the uh, 30 meter Hansen product, but when this was being developed, there was a product in 2008 uh, that had, was there deforestation from 2000 to 2005? And it was a 500 meter product. So, um, what happened, of course, was the new Hansen data set came out and it gave us opportunity to improve. Um, but to just really rush through it, it was a 500 meter product. It only covered the humid tropical forests um, and it came out monthly. Um, and I'm going to jump through what some of the issues were, but yes, uh, you can kind of read them there and and see that uh, although it wasn't perfect, it was great at the time. It was our first kind of near real time data set. Um, although monthly isn't so near real time and 500 meters is a lot of ground to cover if you're traipsing through the Amazon. Um, so as mentioned, the Hansen data set, which we saw some images of before, came out in 2013 and has continued to be updated. And that gave us a chance to uh, improve. And that brought us to former 250. Um, and I'll try to quickly go through what we did. We, um, again, are using the NDVI, the firms, uh, both MODIS data sets, uh, but we dropped the reliance on the precipitation data, both because it led to a lot of collinearity, um, and also because that was, it's a, it was updated monthly, and that's kind of the reason we were stuck at monthly updates. Um, and so I'll describe a little bit about what we do with each of these data sets. Um, the, we come up with a indicator on vegetation color uh, based on NDVI. Um, and there's a bunch of little math equations to make me look smart. Um, but the key point is we, we develop an indicator that gives us signals uh, when there's been a change in vegetation. And we've done some regression analysis to try to incorporate um, 
whether or not this is a seasonal change that's expected or if this is actually something that indicates uh, deforestation. Um, and similarly, we came up with a number of possible indicators uh, for, from fires of deforestation. Um, and after you know, doing some regression analysis, decided that the simplest thing to do was just to count how many fires we, there are. We don't take into account how bright they are. We don't do this. We just say, how many fires are there on a given day? Um, and one thing I kind of skipped over there, um, and some of you may know, the firm's data set is updated daily. Um, and the MODIS data set is updated every 16 days, and that becomes important later. Um, so we have these two indicators. Uh, the NTT, uh, I kind of brushed through that, is the one coming from NDVI. Um, the fires is the one coming from firms. And you, I've kind of broken them up into deciles here. And you can see as you increase in this NDVI indicator and the firms indicator, uh, it leads to increased clearing. It corresponds to increased clearing here. And clearing, by clearing, I mean Hansen clearing. Um, so this isn't ground truth data, but it's the best we can do. Um, so the first thing we tried to do is plug this into a big, uh, complicated, um, uh, non-linear regression. Um, that may look, it looks uglier than it is if, if you've done uh, any machine learning. It's basically a sigmoid function with some cross terms thrown in. Um, but we did this and it worked. Um, but in doing this, uh, we realized that something much simpler actually worked better. And that was, so in the bottom here, this table is basically the numeric kind of table that this, these images, uh, these figures above represent. So just historically speaking, if I am in the fifth decile for fires and the fifth decile for NTT, how much clearing is there on average in this particular region? Um, so, and we found out that just by doing this thing where we kind of look up historically what's happening, we got better results than we did if we ran it into this nonlinear regression. Um, and these are uh, kind of some signals, uh, signals that uh, you can look at what, you know, for a given fire signal and NTT signal, you know, what kind of alert came out of this. It's this blue line on the right-hand column that gives you the alert. Um, and it's kind of interesting because it shows different areas uh, where very different things are happening. Uh, in Brazil, the change of vegetation color and the fires are basically happening simultaneously, whereas in Sumatra, the fires are preceding uh, the change of vegetation color and the opposite in the Congo and the DRC. Um, but all of them led to these uh, spikes uh, in the blue line on the right-hand column. And those are, are what we use to generate our forma alerts. Um, and kind of in review, uh, there's, uh, this, this is how it's improved. So the biggest thing, the one we're most excited about, is we've gone from monthly updates to daily updates. And I'll say more about that in a second. Um, but it basically comes down to the fact that because we're using this simple table lookup, look up, we're able to increment um, the fires data that comes in daily uh, and while we're waiting on the NDVI updates. And it turns out to work well. Um, and uh, the resolution uh, increases to 250 meters um, because uh, the Hansen data, the new Hansen data set is global. We were able to extend into all of the tropics, moist and dry, um, uh, because the new Hansen data set is 30 meter instead of 500 meters. We can give this continuous measure of actually how much force we think is lost. So by continuous, I kind of mean approximately, but uh, you, you have a 250 million year pixel, so there's uh, approximately 64 uh, Hansen pixels in there. So you can actually measure how much of the form of pixel we think is lost. Um, and of course, because Hansen is updated annually, we're able to stay up to date uh, and can make predictions and measure confidence. Um, so going back to what I was talking about with the daily, um, in these images here, uh, I believe this is in Cambodia. Uh, on the right-hand side, you have the form of data for a particular date. 
Um, and that's what's coming out. And in the center, what you're seeing in the blue there are the two weeks of daily data coming in. So we've been getting incremental information um, from fires, and you can see we're seeing a lot of the activity that eventually appears when the NDVI comes up. And so I think I got to rush through this. Um, but in the end, that's what we got. Uh, really quickly, to actually make this work, to update something daily, we, of course, had to depend on Google Earth Engine. Um, of course, we didn't do this. We did this. Uh, the Python API saved our life. And um, we also relied heavily on the Google Cloud Platform. So to say a little bit about it, we do an annual fitting of the data that's done on Compute Engine, and then we export the parameters to a fusion table. And then uh, we have these daily runs, which operate on very, so this annual run we did on a huge compute engine instance that's expensive but doesn't run very long. We have compute engine instances that run the daily updates that run uh, all the time, but they're really small because all they're doing is launching jobs to Earth Engine. And they connect to data store to make sure everything's synchronized and you're not double launching things. And then, of course, we then produce tiles. We use App Engine to, for an API to talk to our website so they know where to grab the tiles, et cetera. Um, so this is really a full integration of a lot of different Google products. Uh, and um, so it's these, you shouldn't really write any of these down. It's going to be open sourced, um, but it hasn't been yet. Um, but we got a paper, and there'll be a blog coming out with some of the Google team that will give you details on where to find that. And uh, while I was up here, I just figured I'd mention a couple things. If you are doing any machine learning on Google Cloud, I have a script that will launch your GPU for you, install everything you need. Um, uh, also, if you're using Python notebooks and you're interested in using Git with your Python notebooks, come and talk to me because I just uh, built this Git and B thing and I'm excited about it and I'm looking for people to test it out. All right, that's it. This should say everyone's name. You were supposed to replace that. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thanks, you all. I have time for a couple questions. You'll, again, they're, they're not open sourced yet, but the top one is what runs most of the code. Um, the former 250EE, the former FIT is what does the annual update. Um, actually, to most interest of people, I think are going to be this EE manager and this former 250 manager, which I use to actually manage launching these jobs and kind of doing a bunch of things. So it's, kind of, it's more generic, whereas these top two might be nice examples of how to do things, but it's very specific to what I'm doing, whereas these things could probably be easily adapted. Uh, and the, the final one, the GEE toolbox, actually is a little command line tool I wrote to, it, just, it's a, it gives me nicer output when I want to look at what tasks are running or cancel tasks, and it has a couple of things like telling me, I, and it has a couple modules that I can check to see if an asset exists or something before I try to create it. That was a great talk, and Global Forest Watch looks amazing. Um, maybe one of the best applications I've seen so far. Um, so I have a question and an ask. The first is, uh, firms will miss a lot of small fires. Uh, so are you thinking of also incorporating the constellations of Landsat and Sentinel-2 together, which could provide you around three-day revisit? Um, not directly with this project. The methodology we used here, in principle, could be applied to, uh, it, it's, it's not, we could easily apply it uh, in other directions. It's a good idea and to see how we can uh, kind of integrate the higher resolution data sets to do that. And that, I would be surprised if we do some direct analogy with this, but I, I think something that's interesting, um, so for instance, TerraI is another data product um, based on MODIS, 250 meters, very similar. Um, and we did some analysis to see uh, how performant one was against the other, and one of the things we found was they both, they both did well, sometimes Forma did better, sometimes TerraI did better, but what was really interesting is whenever you had a pixel that got both a Forma alert and a Terra I alert, it was like the accuracy was like in the high 90 percentiles. Like it was very, very good. Um, so the overlapping pixels were very strong signals. So I think 
kind of looking at, uh, um, I could imagine in the future taking a different product that was a little higher resolution and looking at overlap to, to try to kind of increase accuracy. Thanks.